Well, a good morning and a very happy Monday to you. Cup of coffee in hand, Bible at the ready. I have a question I'm going to deal with today revolving around baptism. Um, baptism actually as a topic is one that um, oftentimes raises questions, uh, depending on the tradition that you're part of, um, what church context you're in right now and how they view these things. Uh, you think about uh, some of the questions like, do we baptize infants, or do we just baptize people who are a little older, who've made a profession of faith, and at least have some reasonable understanding of what that's all about? Um, how do we baptize? Do we baptize uh, with sprinkling, pouring water over the head? Do we fully immerse, or how do we go about these things? Uh, the question I'll deal with today actually has to do with the formula of baptism, and here's the question. This comes from relying on God's Word uh, in our comment section in our YouTube channel. I'd love some insight on baptism in Jesus' name and why we see the apostles doing this in Acts. Thanks, brother. Well, thank you, brother. It's a really, really good question. I'm going to go ahead and invite you, uh, all who are interested in following along here, I'm going to invite you to open to Matthew chapter 28. And uh, this is the uh, end of Matthew's Gospel where prior to his ascension into heaven, of course, we put together all of the post-resurrection accounts, and this is among one of the opportunities that Jesus took to talk to his disciples before he ascended to the Father. And uh, in this uh, episode that we see here, Jesus is sharing with them, giving to them what we refer to as the Great Commission. And I'm going to go ahead and just read from verses 18 through 20, where Jesus came and spoke to them, saying, "'All authority has been given to me in heaven and on earth,' Go therefore and make disciples of all the nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe all things that I've commanded you. And lo, I'm with you always, even to the end of the age. Amen. Again, this is the Great Commission where Jesus sends his disciples out with their marching orders. Uh, he starts by telling them that all authority has been given to him. This is important. Uh, all authority, all that the Father has, he has given the Son. The Son has authority that he is now sending them out based upon. Uh, they are going to go forth with the message of Christ, the gospel of Christ. They're going to be emphasizing the importance of putting faith and trust in the person of Christ and his finished work, and this is what they're going to go out and to do. Now, as they do, it's interesting, too, before we go on, that Jesus does not call them to go out and make converts. Now, it's not that they won't make converts and that that's not important. Uh, it is important, and it's the first step of someone beginning to walk with Jesus. They they maybe have heard about him, they've thought about him a little bit, but the moment of commitment is the moment of conversion. This is where now the Holy Spirit takes up residence in a believer, and they are saved, as we understand it from Acts 2 on, really from John 20 on, um, as Jesus breathes on them and they receive the Holy Spirit. But as uh, as as this is going to be the, the, the call to go, once they are followers of Christ, it's important that they become, as Jesus says here, to, for them to go make disciples, not just converts, is my point. It's somebody who is not just sort of come to Christ and believes, but also one who now grows, who becomes a follower of the master, somebody who um, not just believes in a mental you know, head sense, or even just has received Christ as we typically sometimes refer to it in, in their heart, but they also now become a disciple, somebody who learns from the master, somebody who uh, is interested in growing and does grow and is sanctified, set apart further for Christ. Again, it's not just going out and, and, and making conversions per se, but it's making disciples. Now, with that, Jesus does also, of course, bring the, uh, the outward identifying mark of a disciple here at the outset where he says, go therefore make disciples of the nations, baptizing them, in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Now, before we go on, think about that for a moment. Um, if you were Jewish, as the disciples were, this is yet another reaffirming of something that Jesus has been talking about throughout his ministry, a couple of things, really. One is his equality on identification with the Father, his distinctness from the Father, but yet nonetheless his identification with the Father and equality with the Father. This is, of course, what ultimately got him crucified in the eyes of those who uh, were his detractors. We understand he died for our sin, but those who put him on the cross and wanted him crucified were not thinking this is our great offering for sin. 
they were thinking this person is blaspheming because he being a man makes himself out to be God. And so Christ often identified himself as God, as being uh, one with the Father, not the same person as the Father, but yet being God in the same way that the Father is God. Again, this begins to unfold this idea of Trinitarian theology. And of course, in concert with that, we see the Holy Spirit also here mentioned, identified on equal footing with the Father and Son. So this Trinitarian idea that is here is something that is, at that time in the gospel era, uh, a new understanding among God's people who have now become Messianic Jews. They've put their trust in Christ. So when Jesus has baptized them in the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, that is a formula for baptism, but it is also pregnant with meaning uh, and, and insight into the nature of God uh, himself. Again, as, as, as Trinitarian believers, we believe in one God. Uh, we are monotheists, but this one God has made himself known, uh, this one being known as God uh, has made himself known in three distinct persons, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. I, I can never resist pointing out the fact that while I don't understand how the mechanics of that, if I can use a clumsy term, how that works, how the, the nature of God can be triune yet single in terms of his being, that is a mystery. There is no, there is no, nece- there is no exact uh, uh, thing in, in the world that, that gives that um, you know, example of that perfectly. There are some that come kind of close, but none really that nail it. Um, and so it is a mystery. But nonetheless, this is how God has revealed himself. And Jesus does so here in this Trinitarian baptismal formula. Okay? If I can sort of sound a little bit technical for a moment. And so the question arises, well, if Jesus said to baptize in this way, why do we see Peter, for example, um, inviting people to be baptized into Christ and that kind of thing? Let's look at a couple of those passages. For example, in Acts chapter 2, as Peter is sharing uh, on the day of Pentecost this first message of the church era with, uh, with respect to my dispensational friends who are holding to Acts chapter 9 as the beginning of the church. I tend to be an Acts 2 guy myself here, so indulge me just for a moment. But anyway, in this, in this first apostolic preaching of the uh, post-resurrection uh, Great Commission era, uh, Peter is drawing people, uh, you know, again, to set the stage. In the upper room, they're hiding Uh, or they're waiting, I should say, really. They were hiding in the upper room when Jesus was resurrected, but now they're waiting as he told them to in Jerusalem until they're endued with power from on high. And then the Holy Spirit comes upon the disciples. It's about 120 in the upper room, and uh, the, the Holy Spirit comes upon them, and they come out of the upper room, and they begin to speak in tongues. And they're glorifying God in these unknown languages, unknown to themselves, but they are known by those who are hearing them. And the people are fascinated with this. How is it that we're hearing them in all of these different languages and dialects and everything? And then Peter begins to speak. The accusation is that they're drunk and it's all this kind of thing. Peter says, no, it's just the ninth hour of the day. We're not drunk. But in fact, this is what was spoken of by the prophet Joel. And he goes on to quote uh, from Joel chapter 2. But he then begins to lay out this gospel presentation where the invitation is then to come to Christ. Now, this is something we hold to ourselves, right? Yeah, when we talk about the gospel, we're talking about people getting saved, coming to Christ, trusting in his finished work, becoming a follower of Jesus, right? This is our emphasis, and that's a normal emphasis. That is what we see biblically speaking uh, throughout the New Testament. The idea is that, yes, we are doing the will of the Father by believing in the one whom he sent, and ultimately even being sealed by the Holy Spirit once we're in Christ and this kind of thing. But Jesus becomes the central feature of our gospel presentation. Uh, it's, it shouldn't be devoid of, of the Trinity in that, but really Christ himself becomes primarily the focus of this, his death, his resurrection. Well, here, Peter is talking about these things uh, in, his, in, in Acts chapter 2, and I'm just going to, I'll invite you to read all of Acts chapter 2. Um, and, and there's any number of starting points we could come to, but I'm just going to kind of come up to the verse in particular that's, uh, that, that really speaks to where we are on this topic. But I'll start in verse 36. Therefore, let all the house of Israel know assuredly that God has made this Jesus, whom you crucified, both Lord and Christ. Now, when they heard this, they were cut to the heart and said to Peter and the rest of the apostles, what everybody wants to hear when they share their faith, men and brethren, what shall we do? 
And Peter said to them, Repent, and let every one of you be baptized in the name of Jesus Christ for the remission of sins, and you shall receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. For the promise is to you and to your children and to all who are afar off as many as the Lord our God will call. So a couple of things in this passage, and this passage by itself is worthy of a full hour message and much, much more. But Peter here talks about how these who had rejected Christ, Jesus, who the Messiah came to them that they might put their trust in him, but he was rejected by his people. And really the mistake is that they, he, he was rejected. Now they need to come and believe in him. And in doing so, they will receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. And also they will stand ultimately to, to have now inherited the primary promise that was given to their fathers and also is made to those even who are afar off. Seems to be a reference even to the Gentiles at this point, yeah, those who are far off. Same language that Paul uses in Ephesians chapter 2. Um, so, but that being said, an interesting point here. Um, and let me, let me preface it by saying this. Does it, why is the question of being baptized in Jesus' name only or in the Trinitarian formula that Jesus gave in, in Matthew 28 why is that important? Well, on the one hand, I would say it's there's an importance to this question because of kind of the too far that some groups have gone. For example, there's a group called Oneness Pentecostalism uh, that don't believe in the Trinity, but they believe in something called modalism, the idea that God was one way in the Old Testament, another way during the Gospels, and another way uh, after the day of Pentecost, where he is Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, but not three distinct persons, but the same person just expressed in three different sorts of ways under different contexts. That is a, that's heresy, actually. That, that, that's not what the scriptures say about the nature of God and his triune, or triunity, his triune nature. Um, it may not be something that we can fully get our minds around, the nature and, 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 and of the being of God, yet distinct in three persons, but that's how God has made himself known. The fact that I don't understand it is completely irrelevant to what is. Um, and so to the question of baptizing in Jesus' name only uh, is adopted oftentimes by oneness Pentecostals because they believe, or anyone holds a, a version of oneness, the idea of there being just one person that is God, not just one being distinct in three persons as the Trinitarians would hold. Um, but you'd baptize in Jesus' name only because why would you baptize in a Trinitarian formula? There is no trinity in that perspective. So it becomes important to make sure we define our terms, which is why I spent a minute on talking about the trinity and the fact that Jesus put forth this trinitarian uh, idea in, in, in the idea of baptism. Now, to the question specifically, here is an example of Peter seemingly encouraging people to be baptized into Jesus, right? Not necessarily using the formula of Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. A couple of things I would say to that in this passage. First, uh, I would just point out something that is not immediately obvious, but will be once you see it here. And that is in verses 38 and 39, you actually do have all three of the members of the Trinity mentioned. Uh, you have, of course, the Son being baptized in the name of Jesus Christ, but then you also have this idea of receiving the gift of the Holy Spirit and the idea of inheriting now this promise that is given by God. Uh, of course, in their sense, that would have been the Father uh, and that kind of thing. So, the idea that the three members of the Trinity are mentioned even in Peter's presentation here is not insignificant. He does say to be baptized into Jesus' name, but that's not such an odd thing since he is the central person uh, focused upon in the gospel. It's not that there is a moving away from the idea of Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. It's just an emphasis on the person of Christ. Uh, this would also be true uh, similarly in Acts chapter 4. Um, let me see here. Let me find that passage real quick. Uh, Acts 4. Uh, how about Acts 4, 12? Here we have to start in verse 10. Uh, Let it be known to you all and to all the people of Israel that by the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, whom you crucified, whom God raised from the dead, and by him this man stands before you whole, the healing that Peter had just um, done. This is the stone which was rejected by the builders, which has become the chief of the corner. Uh, the chief cornerstone, nor is there salvation in any other, for there is no other name given under heaven among men which men must be saved. Now again, the idea of, of Father, Son, and Holy Spirit not being present in that activity of, of redemption and salvation, that's not the case. They are included in this. But again, as Jesus himself is the central person in the gospel message, 
not at the absence of the other uh, father of uh, the Father and Holy Spirit, but he is the central person in view that is generally spoken of. Like Paul would say in uh, uh, 1 Corinthians 15, you know, I re- declare to you the gospel that Christ died and he was buried, uh, died according to the scriptures, he was buried and he rose again the third day according to the scriptures. <clears throat> But the idea that this has been the will of God, it's marvelous in our eyes. The idea that um, that one is born again wonderfully by the Holy Spirit, by faith in Christ. There is always this interaction of Father, Son, and Holy Spirit in the idea of, of salvation. But it's just that Christ becomes the one who is most centrally featured in the message. Also, there is the uh, possibility that what's in view here is the idea of being baptized in the authority of Jesus or um, uh, healings in the authority of Jesus. Paul would cast out a demon in Acts 16 out of a girl in the authority of Jesus, in his name, in this kind of thing. We ought not see these things as, as forcing distinction between being sort of Christ only or Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. These are complementary concepts and ideas, and of course, uh, the fact that Christ uh, uh, is as as the second person of the Trinity, there is no in the mind of God in in this in this fellowship of 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 interaction between Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. There is distinction, but there's no separation in the sense that they are somehow pursuing different things, or that somebody is the one person at the expense of the others. There's always this sense of interaction between the three of them. So when we baptize, um, and and by the way, the general practice of the early church, even though we see Peter here, I guess this was another thing I was going to say, is that uh, you will see people baptized in Scripture, but you don't necessarily hear the formula in which they're being baptized or by which they're being baptized. Peter here says the idea of being baptized into Christ. There's no name under given under heaven by which men must be saved. But when it comes to the actual putting people in the water and baptizing them, we're not hearing what Peter is saying in that moment. We're just hearing him talk about this concept. Uh, and then, then, of course, the act takes place. So I, I'm not so sure I would be dogmatic about the idea that the disciples weren't baptizing in the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, even though Peter may be talking about coming to Christ, if, that, if you understand what I'm saying there. Now, one other evidence of that, by the way, that, uh, that the practice of baptizing even then uh, was the main method by which people baptized others is actually found in some, of, some early church writing. Uh, we've mentioned in the past a writing called the Didache. This is actually a... Uh, a witness to the early practices, beliefs of, of the early church. It's very, very brief. It's not a comprehensive theology by any means, but it does give a sort of a keyhole look at some of the things that they believed and practiced in the early church. Uh, this is generally held to go back to around the 200s AD, and so it's it's considered, it's called the Didache of the Apostles, but um, it's, it's likely not written by the apostles, per se, as much as those in the early uh, centuries of the church who were taking their teaching from the apostles and formulating something of kind of a catechism, if you will, an early version of this kind of thing. In chapter 7, and by the way, I would encourage you to get a copy of this. It's, it's not scripture, but the ideas are obviously based on scripture, but it also is really most valuable because, again, it gives us sort of a window of insight into the practices of the earliest part of the church post, uh, you know, post apostolic era, and so in chapter seven, I'm just there's only four verses in chapter seven of the Didache, so I'm just going to read all four, and it's insightful. But concerning baptism, thus baptize ye first, uh, or I'm sorry, having first recited all these precepts, baptize in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, in running water, or like in a river, or something like that. But if thou hast not running water, baptize in some other water, and if thou canst not baptize in cold, in warm water. In other words, the idea was cold water first, but if if you have to use warm, that's fine too. But if you hast neither, pour water three times on the head in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. But before the baptism, let him who baptizeth and him who is baptized fast previously and any others who may be able, and thou shalt command him who is baptized to fast one or two days before. The idea is that they took it seriously and they prepared their hearts for this outward commitment to following Christ. Much more, again, can be said on all of that, but I would just point to two particular passages here where there is emphasis on the practice in the early church of baptizing in the name of the Father, Son, Holy Spirit. Uh, Even if, uh, uh, um, if you couldn't find water to immerse somebody in and you had to pour water over them, you did it three times, 
because there was it was done in the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. And so this is a practice of the early church. The early church took much of its practice from the teaching of the disciples and that, so the or the apostles. So it is it is it is fair and reasonable to assume that this was the practice in the apostolic era as well. So when we see Peter talking about being baptized in Jesus' name, again, it may not be it may not be intended to be seen as a new formula for baptism so much as it is speaking of being baptized in the authority of Christ or in the name of the Savior and that kind of thing without necessarily setting aside in any way uh, the, the personages of the Father and Spirit as well. Um, so that being said, um, hopefully that gives a little bit more of a window into what is likely in view there. Um, there's, there's not really a conflict in practice, I don't believe, between uh, what the apostles were doing after uh, Jesus commissioned them and the commission that Jesus himself gave them. I think that, in fact, um, you know, um, it likely was practiced as Jesus said, but there just happens to be an emphasis and mention here in terms of who, who you're being baptized into, and you're being baptized into the name of Christ. In other words, you are now going to be known as a follower of Christ, which is, of course, um, what we do with the gospel. We're inviting people to come and become a follower of Christ. I, I, I guess in the end of it, what I'm really saying is we don't want to make too much of something. Um, and, and certainly we have. I mean, in, in some circles, a lot has been put into that, even though so little is actually said about it. And that's, uh, that's something to always be a little bit wary of. So I hope that helps. Uh, I hope that uh, provides a little bit of insight. But um, in any case, feel free if you have questions about that or any other subject. Um, you know, I mentioned in church yesterday, we do a Q&A at the end of our services sometimes. And uh, I mentioned to them, and I'll say here as well, I'm not the last word on anything. Uh, I'm just uh, doing my best to biblically try and speak to these things so that we can just kind of interact on them in that. This is, uh, again, a discipleship-based ministry. And so that kind of interaction, I think, can be fruitful. Hopefully it was today. So thanks again for watching and listening. Just uh, would pray that the Lord would bless you and keep you, make his face shine upon you, be gracious to you, and give you peace forever as you walk with the Lord, as you spend time in the Word of God, learning of him, uh, learning what it means to grow in your relationship with him, studying the Word of God, asking the questions uh, of the Lord, of the Holy Spirit as you go through his Word, and that kind of thing. So thanks again for watching. It means a lot that we can spend these times interacting. And until next time, God bless you. Father, thank you for this time. And uh, we just pray that uh, you would take hold of our hearts, our minds, engage us on these levels, Lord, in our hearts, certainly, but also in our mind. We just pray that you would teach us to be students of your word and to dig into these things, to think through these ideas and concepts and uh, as best we can, and of course, under the leading and, and, and with the help of the Holy Spirit. And we just thank you for Jesus, the center of our faith, the one who paid for our sin at the cross and rose from the dead, the one who, uh, whose name we, we are under the banner of. And so... Thank you, Lord, for all that that means, the relationship that we now have with you and the power of the Holy Spirit because of the finished work of Christ. We are so thankful and love uh, both Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. We pray that our growth in our faith would cause us, uh, as we study the Word, to be in daily interaction with you in your triune nature. Thank you, Lord. We love you and thank you and bless you for how beautiful and grand you are and how mind-blowing you really are. And Father, we just ask all this in Jesus' name. Amen.